the buyback. It was juicy. Everyone was excited about the buyback. These are big, big, big ick numbers. Did the White House call you after that? Well, the buyback's consistent with our approach uh, for many years. Uh, it's our fourth financial priority, and we're, we're hitting on all cylinders. D.C. doesn't like it. Well, we're, uh, you know, we raised our dividend. We're investing to grow. Last year was our largest U.S. production ever. The Permian's going to grow another 10% mm -hmm. this year. Uh, the balance sheet's very strong, and the, the cash that we have surplus to that, we've always distributed back to shareholders through a buyback. The company's stronger today than it was just a few years ago, so the numbers are larger, but the approach is very consistent. So the White House has not called you yet? I haven't gotten a call. Okay, I'm, I'm just asking. You never know. Um, the, the other part of that, though, is that a lot of investors would much rather have you buy something than deliver a juicy buyback like this. What do you say to that? Consistently, well, you're saying no. Well, just because you can buy something doesn't mean you should buy something. You should buy the right thing at the right time. And I think we've got a track record of well-timed M&A. We were the first one uh, during the downturn mm -hmm. in COVID to, uh, to do a deal with Noble Energy, which has been a very, very good deal. A uh, nice deal with Renewable Energy Group uh, last year. So we've not been reluctant uh, to do acquisitions, but they have to make sense. They have to create value for shareholders. They have to fit with our portfolio. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to be patient. So I think where it becomes the broader issue then is that everyone's looking for a catalyst. Like everyone likes your story. All the analysts like your story, but they're all neutral. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are neutral on the stock. There's no juicy catalyst. There's no extra bump. The stock has not performed in, in line with Exxon, say, or even BP after its recent announcement a couple of weeks ago. Well, the whole industry is re-rating. Uh, this is an industry that for a decade languished relative to, to the rest of the market. And uh, frankly, over the last couple of years, we've, I think our story's gotten traction with, with shareholders mm -hmm. and, and we've performed very well. I see other companies now that are, are, are experiencing some of the same kinds of things. The sector as a whole is still undervalued, Alex. Uh, last year, we generated 12% of the cash flow in the S&P 500, yet only represent 5% of the market capitalizations. The multiples and the valuation that's attributed to the strong cash flows in our industry are not yet showing up in, uh, in, in stock price. So we're seeing a lot of companies now coming back. Everybody's kind of had their own journey to get mm -hmm. where they are. And uh, I think the sector still has a lot of room to improve. How does Chevron not be boring? Well, we're predictable. Uh, we're doing <laughs> what we said we would do. Uh, sometimes that's called boring. Sometimes that's called safe, reliable, steady, and, uh, and predictable. And I think we've been consistent. We've been disciplined. We've, we've said what we're going to do. We said we're going to deliver high returns and lower carbon. Uh, we have seen in returns improve significantly. We laid out a plan to grow free cash flow 10% per year for the next five years carbon intensity down 30%, and we're distributing cash to shareholders. So we're doing it all. Do you feel pressure to close the gap with Exxon stock, for example, when you've really outperformed them for so long? Well, it's a long, it's a long cycle game. Mm -hmm. uh, Exxon's had their own journey. We've had our own journey. Uh, they're a great company. Uh, they're performing very well. They're a worthy rival. Uh, I enjoy uh, the, <laughs> the, the partnership we have with them in some places and the competition we have with them elsewhere. And, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see them and others in the industry doing well. What is an environment where you would consider another acquisition? Is it dependent on the oil price? Is it dependent on the Permian and peak Permian? Like what, what does Mike look at to know whether or not it's time to pull a trigger? Well, we're constantly looking at companies. And, and really, you know, the first thing you look at is um, asset quality. Mm -hmm. uh, are these assets we would invest in? Would they make our portfolio stronger? Uh, we look at strategic fit. Do they fill any gaps that we might believe that we have? Uh, we look at valuation. Uh, we look at uh, financials. Can, w are the financials accretive to our base case? And mm -hmm. we've got a very strong base case. So you've got to have a deal that really creates value in order to do better than what the, the, the steady as she goes case is. And then, of course, you, you want a company that wants to transact. We don't do hostile transactions. Mm -hmm. and so you've got to have a counterparty that, that's ready. Uh, so there's a whole confluence of events that have to come together. We're always looking. Uh, sometimes we're actually talking. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we have something, we'll come and, and I'll talk to you. About yeah, it. sure. Uh, is, the, is the talking going to happen offshore or is it going to happen in shale? And I, and I bring that up because there's been a lot of worries about Permian productivity. Um, you seem to say everything is fixed uh, yesterday in the investor day. Then there's also worries about offshore ability and offshore growth because you're not in areas like Guyana off the coast of Brazil. Do you feel pressure in one of those areas? Well, I'll start with the Permian, uh, where we've got uh, an, an enormous position. We've got mm -hmm. 27 billion barrels of resource. We've got 2 million acres. Uh, most of it has no royalty on it, so it's tremendously positioned and it's highly economic. Uh, so we don't need more Permian. We can have better Permian, and we're constantly trading and uh, entering into joint ventures to co-develop areas to make the Permian stronger. But our Permian really doesn't need to be bigger. 
Uh, we've got multiple growth engines. Not only is the Permian uh, delivering growth, our big project in Kazakhstan will begin commissioning and start up later this year and over the subsequent quarters uh, will deliver significant growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have deep water Gulf of Mexico projects coming online this year, next year, the year after that will deliver growth. And then we've got other shale and tight uh, positions that don't get the attention the Permian does, but the DJ Basin in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, the Vaca Muerta in Argentina, uh, the Duvernay in Canada all offer growth opportunities for us. So we've got a diverse portfolio of, of growth. We don't really have a gap. So just on Kazakhstan for a second, not to get too nerdy, but um, yes, that can come to fruition, but doesn't it have a lot of political risk now because the pipeline now runs through Russia? So you may be able to develop the field, and that's great, and maybe that's going to be a cash cap, and how do you get it out? Don't you have a problem there? Well, the field today produces uh, around, in around numbers 700,000 barrels a day. This yeah. project will take it up to a, roughly a million barrels a day. And there, the pipeline uh, through southern Russia is the primary route to market. Uh, last year, there were a couple of issues with that pipeline, but it really impacted our, our production by less than 10,000 barrels a day. Uh, this is a risk that's always existed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many partners in the pipeline from European companies to Kazakh and Russian companies, and it's uh, an issue of constant discussion amongst the partners, uh, the government of Kazakhstan with the governor of Russia, and, uh, and, and we've seen uh, continued flow and access to markets through it. So it's, it's a risk like any infrastructure uh, that uh, goes through different territories, different territories uh, but it's one that's been managed well. We're speaking with Mike Worth, uh, Chevron Chairman and CEO for our Bloomberg and radio audiences. Um, so then back to the Permian for a second. Have we learned anything yet about asset life in the Permian? Like, do we know when peak Permian is going to be? You don't want to be bigger, but you want to be better. Is that you guys or is that the asset life? Well, as I said, we've got over 2 million acres in the Permian, and we're only in the very early days of developing that. So we've got We've got a lot of running room. 27 billion barrels of resource at last year's production represents 100 years of resource. So peak Permian uh, depends on your portfolio. Mm -hmm. There are some companies that may have smaller positions mm -hmm. or uh, secondary or tertiary positions and have done a lot of drilling. They may be uh, closer to peak. Uh, we've got such a large position and so much running room ahead of us. You can run 100 years with what you guys have? Well, it's, uh, it's equivalent to Ish. 100 years of resource. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, we produced 700,000 barrels a day last year. We guided to a million uh -huh. barrels a day in 2025, which has been our guidance for a number of years. 1.2 million barrels a day later this year, and then a plateau at that level that will hold for many years into the future. So we've got a long future ahead of us in the Permian. Um, you mentioned cost inflation, problem for everybody, in the Permian in particular, 10 to 15 percent. Um, if you wanted to produce more today, could you with that kind of cost inflation and the labor issues? You know, our, our approach is a very disciplined approach to uh, planning our work and then working our plan. So we're bringing roughly one rig online each quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to execute well. So, so trying to uh, accelerate activity uh, means that you're accelerating uh, permitting and logistics and mobilization of crews. And oftentimes that introduces risk and, uh, and performance issues. So we really don't have a, a need to or a desire to deviate from the plan we've laid out. We want to work mm -hmm. that methodically, consistently, and deliver high levels of performance. Let's talk about LNG for a second. You guys mm -hmm. have a large exposure to LNG. Um, you're developing options to supply uh, LNG to Europe and to Asia. Um, what are the chances that we're going to be in an oversupplied LNG market now? Because everyone's ramping up their LNG supply. When do you think that could happen? These projects are complex and difficult to put together. There yeah. are a lot of projects on the drawing board right now, and Europe clearly needs alternate sources of gas. So you'll see a number of projects being done. Uh, but getting financing for the projects usually requires offtake contracts. Offtake agreements have been slow to come, particularly out of European so buyers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I think that becomes a bit of a limiting factor on which projects will get done and in what sequence. That said, in commodity markets, supply comes on in big chunks. Mm -hmm. Demand grows in a linear fashion. So inherent to that is you end up in oversupplied markets at some point in time when a lot of capacity comes online. And then over time, that capacity demand catches up with it and then goes past and you're in an undersupplied market. So these, these markets become oversupplied at a point in time You've got to make investments that are low cost and have a long-term prospect of strong returns. If you want to arbitrage your overseas LNG portfolio, do you need a U.S. LNG portfolio to do that? It's nice to have multiple sources of supply. And we've got a big gas business in the U.S., and it's growing. Uh, not just uh, you need to in, grow up in more, the though, Permian. to really get that ARB? 
No, our, our gas business here is, is, is growing very rapidly. Uh, okay. We've got a big position in the Haynesville. Uh, most of it prices at domestic gas prices, Henry Hub prices in the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, we've entered into a couple of offtake agreements uh, to convert that to LNG that we can then move to an international LNG market. So it's really about price exposure and getting uh, some, some greater coverage in different price markers uh, into our business. Okay. Let's uh, hit macro for a little bit. I want to sure. ask your uh, take on China. Um, how's China doing? Obviously, the PMI numbers were really strong today. Do you see that consistently happening? Like, is it going to get better and better, or is it choppy? I, I think we're going to see pretty steady uh, progress right. in China. Uh, I spoke with uh, the CEOs of some Chinese companies not long ago uh, who have seen uh, the COVID move through their workforces. People are back at work. Uh, factories are humming. Uh, roads are congested again, more flights are being mm -hmm. added. So all the leading indicators would suggest that economic activity is picking up, energy demand is picking up, and, uh, and I think as we get into the, the middle of this year and certainly into the second half of this year, uh, that demand uh, is likely to, uh, to tighten markets a little bit. So to that point, though, your base case is $60 Brent. So what does that then imply? Because based on that, for example, and we don't have a lot of spare capacity necessarily, do you think that that should be higher? Yeah, or are you well, just the, being super conservative? The, the number we lay out in our investor materials, uh, we try to be consistent with prior years, so there's okay. good comparability, and with uh, general views on long-term uh, prices. So that's not necessarily our price assumption. It's a number that we lay out to help analysts do models and, um, and, and, and maintain some consistency with past guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about the macro environment with uh, Chevron Chairman and CEO Mike Worth for our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences. Um, so to spare capacity. How much spare capacity is there right now in the world? The world's pretty tight right now. Is it? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's some spare capacity in the Middle East. We saw OPEC pull back here uh, last year and, uh, and indicate that they intend to kind of maintain that posture through the balance of this year. Uh, but markets, markets are pretty tight. Uh, we do have Russian barrels still flowing. And I think this is what, uh, uh, you know, last year this time, there, was, there, there were concerns that those barrels would mm -hmm. really come off the market. Prices started, the market started to anticipate that and reflect it. In fact, what we've seen is those barrels have been redistributed, not uh, removed. And, uh, and markets now have settled back into a range where they're not too different than they were a year ago. Uh, what is different is we're seeing demand growth in China. We've got recession concerns in, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and in Europe that to some degree offset that. I think as we work our way through that, that spare capacity becomes pretty important if, uh, if demand grows the way it could in the second half of this year. Do you think the U.S. can be a marginal producer still? I think the U.S., what I see is activity levels in the U.S. are, uh, are pretty high levels. I mean, there's not a lot of rig capacity left. Um, the, the service companies are looking for a contract for another rig. We're yeah. certainly contracted through the rest of this year as we're adding about one rig each quarter. But I think there's, uh, there are limits to how much additional activity the U.S. could undertake in the short term. And, uh, and so I really do think that the, you know, the, the swing producer is, is back into the OPEC world. Interesting. That didn't take very long. No, it, <laughs> it was didn't. only a couple of years where it was here. Um, okay, as we finish out, it's hard to talk to an oil and gas company and not talk about the energy transition. And you guys, in your five-year plan, you outlined investments in renewable biofuels, hydrogen, and carbon capture, and not in wind and solar. Um, what does that mean? Like, what does Chevron see as returns in renewables? Like, are they just bad? Wind and solar are, are great technologies. They're an important part of responding uh, to the, the call for a lower carbon energy system. Uh, they're technologies that we don't bring special expertise to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the returns on them typically have been single digit returns. Our investors and our company looks for double digit returns and we look for things that can leverage our uh, capabilities, our value chains, our customers and our strengths. And wind and solar really don't fit into that. So we're focused on, as you said, biofuels, hydrogen, uh, carbon capture and storage. We're looking at advanced technologies like geothermal that could leverage some of our strengths. So you've got to pick and choose where you're going to invest and apply your people's capability. And, and those are the ones where we think we can make a difference. Do those produce returns yet? And when they do, are we talking like low double digits? Biofuels certainly deliver returns in cash flow today. Our acquisition of Renewable Energy Group last mm -hmm. year is one that we're very pleased with, and we're growing that business. Um, hydrogen and carbon capture are earlier in the development phase. We've got to build out full value chains mm -hmm. on these things. Uh, we've got to build out new commercial frameworks to understand with a, an emitter of carbon, what will they pay to have that carbon captured and stored? How do you divide up the 
credits? How do you account for scope one and two emissions? So they're, these are just new business models, uh, and they require a lot more work uh, before they take off. The nice thing about biofuels, they can drop straight into the existing yeah. distribution system, existing vehicles. They can make a difference today, and they're generating returns today. It's just scalable is the problem. It's scalable Scaling in the up. short term. These other ones, I think, you know, we're, we're working hard to make them scalable in the medium to longer term. Okay. Before I let you go, because I know you got to go, um, do you think we're going to see $60 oil first or 100 I'm not very good at picking oil oh, prices. Of course, he's going to say that. Yes, he is. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think as we get to the second half of this year, the risks to the upside begin to accumulate.